Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. A nearly 200-year-old Lakeville church may close, and your home may not be as safe as you think. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. Parishioners from the Lakeville United Methodist Church are being forced to decide to either merge with another denominational church or close their doors forever. A review of the nearly 200-year-old establishment financial stability by the Blue Water District for the Detroit Conference of the United Methodist Church resulted in the recommendation to dissolve or merge their membership. Longtime parishioners who were married, baptized, and raised their children there are not taking the recommendation lightly. They pledge to fight the action. The final resolve will take vote on uh, by the members to decide their fate. According to national statistics, 800,000 children go missing or are abducted each year in this country, and 24th Street Tavern in downtown Oxford is planning to do something about it. Along with the local Oxford Firefighters Union, 24th Street is partnering to host a special fundraising event in order to raise money to purchase ID kits for every kid in our school district. The kits will allow parents the ability to accumulate a variety of specific identifying information about the child. The information will then be entrusted to the parents and should the need arise, the kit file will also be given to law enforcement officials. The funds will be raised from the classic car registration at the upcoming Lone Ranger Festival, so don't miss it. A local man, Robert Skylas, also a sophomore at Oakland University, recently received top national vocal recognition at a college competition held in Chicago, Illinois. If you would like to hear what his pipes are all about, he often performs at the St. Mary's in the Hills Episcopal Church in Lake Orion, among other area churches. Well, it could be a case of kleptofrendia, or we all need to be extra vigilant during this vacation time of year. Last week, a home on Dunlap Circle was broken into while the resident was away for a few days. When she returned home, she found the front door pried open and several items, including two flat screen televisions, video games, and cash were all missing. Neighbors had seen two people enter the home during that time frame. However, they had seen them visit that residence many times before. As the neighbors were able to identify the suspects, police are pursuing the lead. An Addison couple were seen using their baby stroller and backpack to hide items and while shopping at Myers when they lost prevention confronted the pair outside the store. The couple removed the six uh, month old baby from the stroller and bolted for their car, leaving the baby stroller behind. Oakland County Sheriff's deputies stopped the pair, retrieved the stolen items and returned the uh, shop lifters to the Myers where they were given a citation and returned their stroller. So if you were just given a fishing rod and tackle, please be aware that there are fishing equipment thieves in this area. Last week, a Parker Lake visitor parked his car outside of his girlfriend's house, and when he came back to the car, all of his fishing tackle and rods were gone. Police do have a record of the items with serial numbers, so you may want to check your new equipment against the county records before using the gear. Be aware of who you are hiring to rehabilitate your house. A local resident gave College Works Painting $650 as a deposit to paint his house. According to the agreement, the job was to be completed by no later than June. When the painter did not show up, the homeowner called the uh, contractor more than 30 times with no answer or a call back. Finally, officers went to the contractor's private owned business and he told police it was a complete misunderstanding and the man cut a check for $650, gave it to the police who returned it to the Oxford resident. 
Yeah. I'll tell you what. <laughs> That's it for Extra News this week. If you want to learn more about these stories and others, stop by your local store and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. Or better yet, catch us right here at OCTV Charter Channel 191 and AT&T Channel 99. And coming up next on OCTV Oxford Sports with Jamie Hughes. Also catch Oxford School News with John Ochins. And don't miss Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles, and this is Oxford News This Week, where we bring your news closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Canine Stray Rescue does just that. Some heat in there. Yeah, watch that curveball now. The pitcher's way ahead. And lump Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, bees have a cool trick for hot weather. When honeybee hives get too warm, thirsty bees beg their specialized water foraging sisters for more liquid, which ends up cooling the colony. These water collector bees fly out and fill their bellies with water, then regurgitate it once they're back home. Other bees slurp it up and spit it out around the hive, cooling the hive as the water evaporates. Some bees even stock up for later, like living water tanks. It's critical for their cooling, says Thomas Seeley at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Without that, they can not really control the temperature in the nest on hot days. Wow. In our next story, the latest bag of goodies has been launched to the International Space Station. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket blasted off just after midnight local time on July 18th from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The rocket's first stage returned safely to ground just minutes later, marking SpaceX's fifth successful landing. Afterward, SpaceX boss Elon Musk tweeted that the stage was ready to fly again. The uncrewed uh, Dragon capsule made its way to the ISS, where it was due to arrive on Wednesday carrying a selection of food, water, and other supplies for the station's astronauts, along with more exotic car cargo. The other cargo includes a USB stick-sized DNA sequencer called Mini Ion, made by in the UK from Oxford Nanopore Technologies. It's the first DNA analyzer to head into space and may eventually allow astronauts to directly monitor changes to their genetic code caused by the harsh radiation environment in orbit. For this first flight, astronauts will test the technology that see if it works in microgravity by analyzing the genomes of bacteria, viruses, and of course mice. In our next story, put down that drink. There is strong evidence that alcohol causes at least seven types of cancer, a review has concluded. Writing in the Journal of Addiction, Jenny Connor at the University of Otago in New Zealand says, Alcohol is estimated to have caused about half a million deaths from cancer in 2012 alone. A, that's 5.8% of cancer deaths worldwide. She found evidence of a link between drinking and cancer of the mouth and throat, larynx, and esophagus, liver, colon, bowel, and breast. We see the risk increasing as the amount of alcohol consumed increases, and we agree that there is solid evidence to conclude that the alcohol consumption directly causes cancer, says Susanna Brown, science program manager for the World Cancer Research Fund. Although the highest risks are from heavy drinking, people who drink at low levels are still at risk. According to Connor, there is no safe level of drinking when it comes to cancer. In January, the U United Kingdom's chief medical officer said that no level of regular drinking is without risk to health and reduced the weekly recommended li limit for men down to 14 units, which translates to 0.84 ounces. A shot glass is 1.5 ounces to match advice for women. The exact biological reasons for why alcohol causes cancer remain unclear. One theory is that alcohol can damage DNA, causing harmful mutations. In our next story, you don't want to get bitten? Well, hang out with a hen. Malaria-carrying mosquitoes seem to avoid the odor of chickens. According to fresh research, isolating the compounds involved may lead to new ways of repelling the life-threatening pests. Who knew? And in New Zealand, the New Zealand government has announced a world-first plan to exterminate all non-native predators by 2050 to allow the country's natural ecosystem to recover. Rats, possums, and stoats have ravaged the nation's unique fauna since their introduction, with one-third of native birds now extinct and the iconic flightless kiwi under serious threat. 
Prime Minister John Key said on Monday that 28 million New Zealand dollars would be committed to a private public venture designed to fund large-scale predator eradication programs. By 2050, every single part of New Zealand will be completely free of rats, stoats, and possums, he said. This is the most ambitious conservation projects attempted anywhere in the world. Improvements in pest control strategies will help to make this dream a reality. Wayne Linklater at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, told the country's Science Media Center. After decades of slow and small incremental progress in new technologies for pest control, the pace of it is advancing on several fronts. Advanced trap designs, new lures, baits and poisons, biosensors and remote control delivery of all these and more on a grander scale, he says. These approaches have already helped to eliminate in introduced predators from over 100 of the nation's offshore islands. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. Welcome to the Oxford Wildcat School Update. It was school board meeting time again last week, and part of it revealed some great financial news for our district. The board approved refinancing $42 million of school bonds from an interest rate of 4.5% down to 2.1%. Assistant Superintendent for Finance Sam Barna explains more. So that savings in dollars from a net present value standpoint, in other words, pulling those dollars in the future and discounting them at a certain percentage rate, represents a seven million, a little over a $7 million net present value savings to the district's taxpayers uh, in terms of those, those debts, that debt load. And so what that means for a, a, an average individual is, is we're gonna be paying off and saving in totality $7 million dollars for our district taxpayers over the course of the next several years and so we're paying off debt we're saving money and um, basically it's a win-win for everyone last year the state passed a requirement for measurable goals in learning our curriculum and instruction man Ken Weaver announced our adoption of a program called SLO that stands for student learning objective it is designed to address students needs over a specified period of time and show progress it will be phased in this year also a new principal for crossroads Guy Cocachetta taught special ed for Oxford for two years prior to that a teacher and administrator in Romeo for nine. He has a master's in educational leadership and has been most recently at our high school. What would summer be without checking in with Ann Whedon over at the bus garage? Actually, it's a very critical part of our school district. We make, the guys make major repairs, or not major repairs, but they make repairs every summer, uh, do some touch-up work. They go over every bus and uh, do seat recovers and, and uh, check them out, make sure, see what the rust situation looks. Uh, of course, our roads and our back roads don't uh, help the rust situation out here in Oxford much no. at all. Uh, they're, they're, they, can, they can get pretty rusty, so they're, they're continually, every, continuously every summer making, uh, making repairs repairs and, and looking things over, looking the entire fleet over. I asked Ann if we got any good bus deals this summer. We did. This summer we ended up purchasing two uh, slightly used um, minibuses uh, that will help our minibus fleet out uh, tremendously. Uh, we'll have five buses that are in excellent condition, uh, three years old or newer, uh, out there picking up our special needs children and, and uh, they need to be in those uh, uh, newer buses that we know aren't going to break down or have, have too many difficulties with them. These buses fulfill a unique role. Them. It makes it a lot easier for us to pick up students that maybe can't be picked up uh, along the roadside. We need to pull in driveways, or which we do, um, or that just makes them easier. They're smaller, lower to the ground, makes them easier for some of our students that maybe have difficulty with uh, some of the larger steps on our bigger buses, yeah. and uh, just just makes it a lot lot easier for the drivers. Uh, and uh, we have some that have attendance on them that you know that they're they're in. A lot 
closer proximity to the students who maybe have seizure issues or something. What we forget is that these buses transport special needs kids to programs outside the district. Chief Technician Mark Hillebrand and Director Ann Whedon explain. But it's just a little more uh, difficult to if you have one break down to send out one that matches its particular needs with a number of wheelchairs and with air conditioning, without air conditioning, and they can be quite a distance away. Well, that's another thing. People don't realize that uh, sometimes you've got to make runs further than Oxford, don't you? Yes, but we do. Every day. Yes. Yeah. yeah we, we have students in center programs that go to Waterford and to Bloomfield Hills, and that can be a, a distance, and especially if they break down and, you know, that sends Mark and Mike, you know, 20, 30 miles away to pick up a bus. Okay. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often. Doesn't happen. Very yeah, often. right. No. While we're in pretty good shape with our full time staff, there's always a need for backups. Over the last couple of years, we've had a driver shortage, and we're always looking for local community members who, uh, who may want a part time job as a sub bus driver. Uh, we do train, we pay to train, and um, it's a good job. You got summers off, holidays. If you've got students in the district, it, uh, it you know it works well with their schedules. We checked in with Superintendent Tim Throne last week, asked him if there was one special thing he remembers about the past school year. I think I'd go back to the, the trust being restored, whether it was um, be between individuals, between uh, schools and central office, whether it was the community and the schools. I think I think we've um, been building and repairing some of that trust at a multitude of levels this past year. We'll have more of that interview on a special episode of Schooling Around. That's the Oxford School Update for this week. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. And back with you in Oxford News this week. Hope you're doing well wherever you are, kind of enjoying the summer. We've had a great time out at all the uh, Parks and Rec softball uh, things that have been going on with the ladies and the, uh, the seniors. And we caught up with Rod Wright. He's out there and about catching up with some interviews, checking out the last part of the Parks and Rec softball. Well, I'll tell you, we had one heck of a game today, and I got a couple of the great players right here. Well, well we got a photobomber right over here. This must be your dad, huh? No. No? <laughs> yeah, that's my dad. Is that your dad? And I have, who do I have? Nicole Claire Howe. And you were playing shortstop, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Good plays out there. Thank you. You guys played really good defense. <laughs> Thanks. And then how about center field? Julia Lawler. Yeah, you, you caught two out there, didn't you? Um, I caught a pop fly, and I got a couple grounders, too. Though. Yeah. Good job. Well, I was really, really impressed with how well you played. You guys are hitting good, too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it must be nice to be a pitcher on your team, and she can just relax, huh? Yeah. You made it easy for her, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I guess, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, girls. And do you like Oxford? Yeah. Isn't it cool? Yeah, yeah. of course, because you won. Get out of here. <laughs> come on. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm here with these girls that come over to Oxford to beat us up. Thanks a lot, girls. <laughs> uh, we, we had a call. I have... Uh, Catherine, sh sh how pronounce your name? She's Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Catherine Shetler. Okay, are you sure? Yes. Okay, good. And? Sabrina Chiz. Okay, you pitched the first game. Yeah. You got a good defensive team behind you. Did you thank all your, your fielders out there? Yes. <laughs> and you did pretty good today at the bat, too, didn't you? Thank you. Now, where were you playing out in the field? Uh, first and third. Okay, see, we could, we don't get the third base because you're next to us and we can't see you and all that. So, uh, how did you girls do this year? Um, overall, I think we did very well. We improved a lot. Yeah, I thought you did, did, did really good, especially defensively, don't you think? 
Yeah. <laughs> Were you changing speeds out there? Um. A little bit. A little bit. Like when I get mad, I go faster. So. I thought you got a little bit faster as you got. Were you mad? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't look mad. <laughs> <laughs> to be happy you're winning <laughs> yeah but i was like they weren't catching the ball so i was like mm. <laughs> who wasn't catching the ball your team was playing really good a few of pitchers them dropped <laughs> a few of them dropped pitchers you, uh, pitchers never give your fielders a hard time you got those are your best friends i know <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just giving you a hard time so how long have you girls been playing together um, just this season. Just this season? Yeah. And you, are you from Troy or that area? We're all from everywhere, pretty much. From everywhere? Okay. Well, good. Well, thanks a lot for coming to Oxford. Since you won, we have a place called Frosty Boy. That's tradition. You, you take your, have your, have mom and dad take you to Frosty Boy <laughs> just down the road, okay, for ice cream. Thank you. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, girls. Thank and you. Don't thank come you. back soon, okay? Go away. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Okay, we are here with the Oxford 14U travel team. Good job, girls, this season. I know it's a tough day. You, you, you say stuff. See, you talk into this thing, okay? They play much better softball than to interview, right? I thought you did good. Where's Lupu? Good job out there at shortstop. Yeah, put that to your mouth. There you go. Again, good field or not a very good interview. Okay, girls, I need you to do me a favor. And we'll do like, you're watching OCTV and point at the camera. Can you do that? Can, can, you, can you do it? You can do it? Okay, okay. I'm going to get out of the way because we're going to get the ugly old man out of here. Okay? All right, here you go. And I'm counting three. We'll do a couple takes. One. Don't look at me. And great interviewing with Rod right there. Again, we're looking forward to a great fall sporting season. Check it out. Fall sport practice dates and student athletes should check out the website if you're planning on participating in any of the fall sports, grades 7 through 12. You must remember, you got to have that physical. And right on their website, OxfordAthletics.org, you can download the form and all their practice schedules and what you'll need before even attempting to try out for one of the games. Again, OxfordAthletics.org, right at your fingertips, always about Oxford sports. While you're on the World Wide Web, I urge you to stay tuned to our website. We're at OCCTV.org. Hit the Programs tab. Hit the uh, Any tab there, and you can catch it on your iPad, computer, or your phone and catch any one of our programs, whether it be sports or me a meeting or anything you'd like to see. It's always available through OCCTV.org. We do broadcast our sports and those softball matches on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday between 1 and 6. Check it out, OCCTV.org. That's going to wrap it in sports. Once again, I want to thank Kyle Stage behind the counter and also Rod Wright covering all them great softball matches along with our good uh, friend Bill Service, our leader, and again, we've had a great time out at Parks and Rec bringing a little bit of softball action to your television. Till next week, I'm Jamie Hughes. Enjoy the week. Good take care of everybody. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Fiat Chrysler will invest $1.5 billion to convert its Sterling Heights assembly plant in suburban Detroit from unibody to body and frame construction to build the next generation Ram 1500 pickup. The automaker has confirmed that the plant will end production of the slow-selling Chrysler 200 sedan in December to begin the conversion. As Automotive News first reported in September of 2015, the Ram 1500 will move from its historic home at Warren Truck Assembly to Sterling Heights Assembly. The two plants are within about 10 miles of each other in northern Detroit suburbs. 
After production of the current generation Ram 1500 is completed, Warren Truck will be retooled to produce the Jeep Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer luxury SUVs. F FCA said the investment is subject to the formal approval and of incentives by the state and local entities. No additional jobs at Sterling Heights or Warren Truck were announced. FCA previously invested $1 billion into Sterling Heights assembly to build the unibody 2015 Chrysler 200. Earlier last month, FCA announced a $1 billion investment in its assembly plants in Toledo, Ohio and Belvedere, Illinois to boost production of Jeep products. The announcement included 700 additional jobs at FCA's Toledo assembly complex. Both sets of investment are part of FCA's latest plan to boost production of the hot-selling and highly profitable Jeep and Ram products at the expense of slow-selling products such as the Chrysler 200 and Dodge Dart. Through the first half of the year, uh, Jeep sales are up 17% and Ram pickup sales are up 9%. Meanwhile, 200 sales are down 62% while the Dart is down 41%. And at Audi, when the 2017 Audi A4 all-road reaches dealership slot this fall, it will start at $44,950, including a $950 shipping charge. The A4 All-Road, which was unveiled at the 2016 Detroit Auto Show, is one of 20 vehicles Audi AG CEO Rupert Statler said the brand plans to launch globally in 2016. In addition to the base premium trim, the A4 All-Road will be available in premium plus trim starting at $47,950 and prestige trim starting at $52,350 and prices will include shipping. The A4 All-Road is powered by a 2-liter engine that produces 252 horsepower and 273 pounds-feet of torque. Audi's 7-speed S-Tronic dual-clutch automatic transmission is the only transmission offered. Nearly an inch and a half has been added to the A4 All-Road's ground clearance compared with the A4 sedan. A panoramic sunroof and three-zone automatic climate control are standard. Standard fa uh, safety equipment includes Audi's base pre-sense technology package, which automatically prepares the vehicle for an antici anticipation of an impact by beginning to close the side windows and panoramic sunroof, pre-tensioning the front seat belts, and preparing the brake system for a quicker response during an unexpected or emergency maneuver. Audi Present city, te city technology is also standard. It can detect cornering and stationary vehicles as well as pedestrians at speeds up to 52 miles per hour and can initiate full braking when a potential collision is detected, Audi says. Wow. And at VW, a federal judge has granted preliminary approval for a $10 billion settlement in which Volkswagen AG will offer to buy back up to 475,000 polluting 2-liter diesel-powered vehicles. U.S. District Judge Charles Breyer of San Francisco set an August, that is to say October 18th, hearing for final approval. The preliminary approval means Volkswagen will soon able, enable owners of the vehicles to access a website to learn how much they are eligible to receive. Owners will be paid at least $5,100 in compensation in addition to the value of the vehicle. The value of the car may decline based on the number of miles driven, but will not be lower if it has dents or scratches. The settlement announced in June is worth $14.7 billion in total. It includes the largest ever automotive buyback offer in the United States, repairs, if regulators approve, and payments to government agencies. And that FCA, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, says it's recalling nearly 410,000 vehicles worldwide because of a defect that can lead to a loss of propulsion. The automaker said on July 22nd it will update software and replace wire harnesses to address the electronic issue that appears on a small number of vehicles. The recall includes 2015 model Chrysler 200 midsize sedans, Ram Pro Master City small vans, Jeep Renegade and Cherokee SUVs and some 2014 Cherokees. The recall includes about 323,000 vehicles in the U.S. The automaker didn't disclose the schedule for when the recall repairs will begin, and the automaker said if owners suffer a loss of propulsion, the issue can typically be temporarily resolved by stopping the vehicle and restarting the engine. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as, as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. How about that? They play softball and they promo real good. So, thank you very much, folks, for watching. And they giggle a lot, too. We had a great season. Thank you. Good night, everybody.